Okay, there being no questions, um, we'll move on to um, tumor immunology uh, topic. Um, there has been a lot of uh, investigation in the role of, to study the role of immune system in the development and progression of tumors. As a matter of fact, those are the studies that very early, 18th, uh, no, 19th or 20th century studies, late 19th century and early 20th century studies that led to the discovery of uh, uh, MSG in animals uh, first and then humans later on. Um, but um, uh, in order for the immune system to react against, there's got to be some something different because otherwise the tumor is a self tissue. There shouldn't be any reactivity to the self tissue. Um, how do we, did, what, what led to the belief that the immune system does have a role to play in tumor progression and um, its rejection, um, its regression and rejection, um, were a number of um, facts. Some came from the clinical observations, other from the, um, from the, uh, from experimental models. And what I'll do is I'll go over what is the evidence for role of the immune system in tumor immunosurveillance. Uh, evidence for immune reactivity against tumors. Humans, those humans who were unfortunate to have some sort of malignancy or the other, often they had antibodies that reacted with the tumor tissue, malignant tissue, but not with the normal. They also had lymphocytes that reacted to extracts of tumor tissue. Um, and we're, we're going to talk about a little bit more about that, but also we'll talk about what are the changes that, um, uh, 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 that occur in malign uh, during the progression of uh, normal to malignancy. We'll talk about uh, tumor and host components that um, um, affect tumor progression, okay? And then we'll talk about the, how uh, the observations that there is immunogenicity of tumors um, used for the treatment and management of tumors. Um, okay. Um, the evidence for immune, the role of immunosurveillance in malignancy is, first of all, there is an inflammatory response, inflammatory response in the tumor. And early on it was observed, and if one looks at it, actually one can see mononuclear infiltrates um, in tumors, and one can find, if one can stain those, um, one can find T cells, both CD4 and CD8 T cells, mononuclear cells, and other inflammatory cells as well. This just represents that they are uh, CD4 as well as CD8 cells. You don't see the different colors here, uh, but um, this was taken from your book, and if you look at the book, there are uh, clear differences, um, and they are both CD4 and CD8 cells found in the inflammatory tissue. There was also a relationship that, although that is somewhat, has become somewhat dubious as to how strong that is, um, that relationship is, that there was a relationship between good prognosis and more infiltration. In other words, more inflammatory response and better prognosis for that tumor. Okay, here's actually, the, you know, CD8 cells, positive cells, and CD4 positive cells in the inflammatory uh, in, uh, in, in the inflammatory areas of uh, around the tumor or within the tumor. Uh, association with immunodeficiency. A lot of immunodeficiency diseases are, they, uh, those who have immunodeficiencies, they also have higher incidence of tumors, higher frequencies of tumors. Um, primary immunodeficiency, there's a lot of lymphomas that are associated with primary immunodeficiency. Cancer patients, uh, there's a um, table in your um, uh, book uh, that shows a lot of correlation between uh, different kinds, kinds of tumors and the um, transplant, the, the immunosuppressive treatment for transplants. So whenever there is immunodeficiencies, there are um, some, or one or the other kind of uh, uh, malignancy. 
acquired, and the, one of the acquired examples is the immunosuppression for transplants. And there are higher incidence of lymphomas, cervical cancer, liver cancer, skin cancer, Kaposi's sarcoma in those patients. And another example, of course, HIV infection, it is associated with much higher incidence of Kaposi's sarcoma. Okay. Uh, in uh, malaria patients, there is some immunosuppression induced by uh, the, uh, the malarial parasite, and those patients have got higher incidence of Burkitt's lymphoma, EB virus-induced Burkitt lymphoma. And then uh, during autoimmune diseases where there is imbalance of immunoregulation, there is also, it, they, some of these are also associated with lymphomas. So whenever there is a defect in the immune system, that can lead to higher incidence of malignancies. And that gives an indirect evidence that there is some role for immunodeficiency, for the immune system in regulating uh, progression or onset of malignant diseases. Um, then the, uh, the experimental evidence comes from the animal model where one can immunize animals with tumors. I'll show you some um, animal models later on, how those experiments were done. Okay? Um, immunity is transferable from immune animals to naive animals. So you can immunize the animal. They will be resistant, not only they, that they will be resistant, but you can take their lymphoid cell and transfer into naive animals, and these recipients will also become resistant to that tumor. Clinical significance of that is there because there are immune cells that are being stimulated in vitro and being transferred into patients with malignancies. That's a one form of immunotherapy. We'll talk about that later. Uh, Tumor-specific antibodies and cells have been detected in humans with some malignancies. Also, of course, it has been shown in animal models as well. I mentioned that earlier. Okay. <clears throat> Obviously, as I mentioned earlier, in order to have an immune response against a tissue that originated within the cell, there has got to be some difference between the normal and the malignant self tissue. Um, and there are a variety of tumors where new antigens have been characterized. Some of it fall in sort of what is referred to as oncofetal antigens. These are antigens that are expressed primarily in the fetal tissue during the tissue development or in, on cells that are uh, in the process of differentiation. And I'll give you some examples of those later on. Okay? Um, the, the, most, um, the two examples that I will dwell on uh, has got some clinical relevance, uh, are alpha fetoprotein uh, and carcinoembryonic antigen. And there is another one, CALA, C-A-L-L-A, um, chronic lymphocytic leukemia, I think it stands for, but I'm not, you know, I won't bet on that. Okay, oh, common acute lymphocytic uh, leukemia antigen. It's also referred to as CD10. This is normally present on very early, undifferentiated uh, pre-B cells. But in the case of malignancy, that antigen persists on these cells. So they, they, they essentially that leukemic, those leukemic cells are uh, undifferentiated cells that have been arrested at that pre-B cell stage. Okay? And the antigen is used for diagnostic purposes for characterizing the tumor. The leukemia. Yes. B cells. B cells. Undifferentiated B cells. CD10 is very early antigen on pre B cells. Okay. So th these antigens, let me emphasize again, are normal antigens, but not normal for fully differentiated tissues or adult tissues. Then there are tumor-associated transplantation antigens. These are characteristic of tumors. They are present on tumors, 
And they, since they are present on tumors, and any immune response will lead to rejection of that tumor. And that's why they are also known as tumor-specific transplantation antigens or tumor-associated transplantation antigens. They are on, actually on cells, whereas the antigens like alpha fetal protein or CEA can be secreted antigens. alpha fetal protein actually is almost always a uh, secreted antigen. CEA can be found both on tissues as well as uh, um, in secretions. And CD10 is primarily on the cell surface. Um, okay. Some of these may be virus-associated antigens. There are a number of viruses that cause human tumors. Kaposi sarcoma has been, you know, has been shown that the cause for you know, that, that tumor is a, a herpes virus. When Dr. Hunt, uh, Dr. Richard Hunt um, starts his section, he will have a whole lecture on, um, on uh, uh, oncogenic viruses. Okay? Um, human papilloma virus. Human papilloma virus has been associated with the cervical cancers. As a matter of fact, there is an attempt to get a, have a vaccine against that. Okay? Uh, then there are um, tumor-specific transplantation antigen, as, a, as opposed to virus-associated, and these are on spontaneously occurring tumors where there's no virus etiology established. And the uh, best examples of that are really um, uh, animal tumors where one can, in a normal animal, inject certain chemicals and induce a tumor. Um, so those are different types of tumor associated or tumor, uh, antigens that are seen during malignancy, malignancies. I'll tell you a little bit about the, the clinical use of alpha fetal proteins. It is um, particularly increased in um, testicular um, uh, and liver cancers. And I've got one example of um, how it is, has been used um, in staging or diagnosis of um, uh, testicular or liver cancers. Okay? It can also be used in patient management, how the, the treatment is going to be um, given. Uh, you'll see, you'll, you'll, it, it will be more clear when we actually come to the example. It is also used for sort of detection of tumor, meaning that, you know, you suspect that, you know, if levels of those antigens, those proteins go up, you suspect that there is some kind of malignancy, particularly of those. Here's an example of following um, a patient uh, and testing for um, alpha fetal protein. Um, there was a diagnosis of a tumor, of course. There was archae archaeectomy performed, removal of the testes. And uh, uh, prior to that, there was a fairly high level of um, alpha fetal protein. The normal levels are around, um, what, 20 nanograms per ml in the, in the serum. So it's a low concentration present in the normal individuals as well. But in, during malignancies, it goes up. As you can see here, about fivefold um, that of normal level. And after archaeotomy, it came down to more like normal levels or below that, okay? Upper limit of normal concentration is here. Okay, but as with time went on, it started increasing. And at this stage, there was a detection of a a recurrence of the tumor, and the person was treated uh, with chemotherapeutic agents, and with that, the levels went down again, okay, and remained low with maintenance therapy. So the bottom line is, take-home lesson is, one can use the concentration, blood serum concentration of alpha fetal protein to monitor a patient. And if it starts going up, one has to get worried and get concerned and investigate for the recurrence of tumor and apply treatment. Okay? 
Um, the concentration normally is less than 20 nanograms per ml. Is abnormal, abnormal concentrations. If they are abnormal, 100 to 350 possible <coughs> malignancy, particularly of the liver. Of liver okay? Um, it's used in uh, liver cancers. Okay, 350 to 500, probable hepatoma. Further up, 500 to 1,000, likely hepatoma, and 1,000, over 1,000, you know, you can almost be certain that it is a malignancy of liver. Yeah. Testicular cancer is similar, similarly. So you've got to investigate what it is, okay? Similar concentrations. They, you do not have to memorize those exact numbers, but know the okay, from 20 to 100, five-fold increase, or 20 to 1,000, that's 50-fold increase, um, should lead you to be concerned about the patient you know, who you are monitoring. Okay, CEA is a similar antigen, but not in the case, in this case, not liver cancers, but uh, uh, colon cancers is more characteristic of, although it has been seen increased in mammary tumors and some other tumors as well, but more broad. Uh, range of tumors. Uh, it is again, once again, used for staging and prognosis, uh, monitoring uh, response therapy, and detection of tumor recurrence. Um, the example is here. Here's an example of colon, colorectal cancer. Start off with here. There was, cancer, uh, the, uh, the, the, there was a surgery for local recurrence. This is for the after primary um, surgery or resection of tumor. It is fairly low. Um, it started increasing, and it was uh, determined that there was a local recurrence. It was removed, came down again, and as it went, it started going up. There was chemotherapy um, administered, and it starts going up, down again. Again, there was a recurrence. Here, and that was that correlated with increased levels of CEA that was removed and they, it came down again. Okay, so CEA, just like alpha fetoprotein, can be used to monitor, and any increase in its levels is indicative that there is either a metastasis or local recurrence. Uh, is a diagnostic adjunct, symptomatic, uh, indicates symptomatic patient, um, elevated values of five to 10 times the upper, level, level, upper limit are indicative of that. Yes, there are other conditions, okay? And I'll tell you, you know, a little bit uh, later on. Um, alpha beta protein and uh, CEA both actually have been shown to be in hepatitis of different kind. Alpha fetoprotein in the case of hepatitis, uh, CEA is increased in the smokers. And heavier the smokers, the higher the level. Okay? Uh, but never tenfold or to that you know, magnitude. Okay, in this case, normal values are obviously 10 nanograms per ml. So, you know, you've got to, to, you know, pay attention to the history as well. Slight increase or two-fold increase, um, you may further investigate that, okay, the person is a smoker or non-smoker, okay? Or if it is uh, alpha fetoprotein, does the person have other conditions that may cause liver inflammation, hepatitis? <clears throat> okay. Transplantation antigens. Now we come to sort of in experimental models how it was shown. Uh, there was a, has been a lot of work with animal models of tumor. Uh, okay. Um, and um, what has been seen that certain viruses can induce tumors in these animals. And this was, this is an example of how, what is the what are the characteristics of virus-associated antigens? Okay. Tumor-associated transplantation antigens, but 
virus common to, you know, virus-specific uh, uh, or virus-induced uh, tumors. Uh, one can inject with um, a virus, SV40 is one of the examples. One can get the uh, tumors of different histological types or more than one tumor. If one takes out the, one of those tumors, okay, referred to as A and B, makes a cell suspension out of that, okay, from those tumors, immunizes an animal with a radiated uh, tumor of the A type, okay, and then challenges two weeks later with um, either the same tumor, A tumor, or tumor B, if one uh, challenges with tumor uh, A, one gets a protection against tumor, okay? Not only that, but also, although immunized with the tumor A, induced by the, that virus, uh, a challenge with tumor B does not result in, tu in, a, in a tumor growth. So there's a cross immunization with the two tumors induced by the same virus. And that is because the virus determines what tumor specific transplant tumor associated transplantation antigen is induced in those malignant cells. It's the virus that determines it and it's a common antigen. Okay, the bottom line, just to summarize it, if a tumor is induced by a virus, if more than one types of tumors are induced by a virus, all tumors induced by that virus will share the same tumor-associated antigens, cross-protection. Okay, as opposed to that, if one induces a tumor with a chemical, and there are lots of chemicals that are carcinogenic, and one of them is a methylchloroquine, MCA, one can use, and that has been used to induce a lot of uh, animal tumors. One injects um, the chemical a few weeks later, may take more than two weeks, may take a couple of months even sometimes. Uh, you may find one tumor or more than a tu one tumor in these animals. One can assign them A and B and isolate those tumors same way as uh, the last experiment. One can immunize naive animals.